The digital computer means it's discrete. Okay, discrete means that it's basically on those clocks. Remember, it's driven by a clock. So on every clock tick, it it calculates a value or reads a value from a set. So it's uh, it's a very discrete time type of thing. We also have just discrete sensors like limit switches or proximity sensors that say it's either there or it's not there. All right. Or we have a switch. You can have the switch can be open or the switch can be closed. All right. Those are all kind of discrete inputs. We can have discrete outputs like lights. The light is either on or the light is off. Okay. The motor is either running or it's not running. Or we can control something with a motor. We can control the speed of the motor. Um, and that would be an analog control. Okay, so this class focuses primarily on analog. In the PLC1 class, we spent the majority of our um, uh, of that class focused more on the discrete control and discrete inputs and discrete outputs. This class is focusing on analog. Okay. All right. So with the digital signal. Right, the digital signal again, it was either uh, a high or an on or off, which we like to call a zero. Now, really, inside of a computer, that high represents a voltage, it's got a high voltage, and a low represents a low voltage. A lot of times we think a low means zero, but technically, a low. Uh, using what they call TTL logic, which is transistor, transistor logic, okay, gates. Um, the TTL logic is got a max voltage of five volts and a minimum voltage of zero or ground. And so if the voltage is between two and five volts as an input into, into the PLC or into uh, a certain circuit, Okay, again, this is for the um, at a TTL level. Okay, but two to five volts, anything in this range of two to five volts is considered a high or a one. But in uh, anything below 0.8 volts, then is considered a zero. And then we have this range between 0.8 volts and two volts. This is like, you know, no man's land here. This is. Uh, uh, the DMZ, you, you, you don't ever want to be in there, okay? And, and for us, we really shouldn't, most of the time we don't have to worry about that as, as technicians. Um, it's just uh, these are like design things that whoever's designing uh, this, the system needs to make sure that we don't get there. However, as technicians, we may run into this some. Uh, we had like here in the classroom, we had one of the robots and it had like multiple sensors there. Uh, we had proximity sensors connected to the robot. And so if you trip sensor one, you know, then it should sense that. If you trip sensor two, then it should know sensor two's trip. But what would happen is if you would trip sensor one and two and there was four sensors there, if you would trip sensors one and two, what would happen is that low voltage, uh, it, it was a bad ground on the robot. And so what would happen is that low voltage actually would creep up here and up to the point that all the sensors would turn to one. And so it thought all the sensors were tripped instead of just two sensors. Okay, so we had like four sensors in there. But if you if you triggered two or more of them, that voltage, because like I say, it actually had a per ground in there, but the the voltage would actually rise up and and then it would think all four sensors were on or being activated. Okay. So, you know, like I say, that you get this um, anywhere between 0.8 and 2 volts, you should never ever be. And if you are, it's you, you know, it might be you have a wiring problem or something. All right, so with analog signals, okay, analog signals can vary 
So they're not just going to be a high or a low, but they can move around. Okay, now they can move around between two limits. Okay, notice that two limits is in like bold and blue text there. Anytime in my slides, if you see anything like a different color and or bold font, you can guarantee there's a test question on that. Okay, so there's a test question that says the analog signal varies between blank, uh, between two blank. And the answer to that that goes in that blank is the word limits, not values, but limits. Okay, because a value is, is a value, could be, you know, 0, 3.14, you know, 6.7 or 10. Okay, a value is, is the value. That's the value of it, but it's a limit. So you have a max and a minimum range for this analog signal. So it can bounce around in there. Okay, and so the analog signal can be anywhere within these two limits. All right, so... Um, the other thing with uh, analog signals is you can have either a voltage signal or a current signal. All right. And so when we have sensors hooked up to a PLC or robot or something, and it's an analog sensor, a lot of times they use the term instrumentation. Sometimes if you're looking for a job, you know, if you're checking, you know, jobs.com monster jobs or whatever um looking for a job you might see like a, a lot a lot of times like the job title might be instrumentation technician or something like that where it's somebody who's um taking care of and correcting or um calibrating uh analog sensors okay so if you see the term like instrumentation technician um that's kind of what that's referring to. So instrumentation is kind of another term for an analog sensor. Okay. And of course, you know, these sensors, we can measure temperature, we can measure flow rates, we can measure pressure, we can measure force, we can measure levels, um, you know, just about anything in the world that you want to measure, right? Somebody has come up with some sort of sensor that if it's something that we might just measure with our, our meter stick or something, right? Somebody's come up with a way to measure it with a sensor and send it to a PLC. All right, so um, analog sensors measure or kind of are answering the question, how much do you have? So like, well, Digital sensors like a limit switch or a proximity switch says it, it's kind of asking the question, is it there or is it not there? Okay, and so it's going to give you if it's there, it's a one. If it's not there, it's a zero. Okay, uh, kind of deal, uh, depending on whether it's a normal open, normal close kind of switch. But with analog sensors, they're asking how much is there or, or um, what the value is. Okay. So the, again, there, that value can range um, between those two limits. Okay. All right, so I mean, this slide's still saying, I've, I've pretty much already talked about this. It can, it can vary for between any of these values. All right, so when we talk about analog signals, we can have two types of analog signals. One of them is a voltage signal, and the other is a current signal. All right, now we know from DC circuits that, you know, to have a current, you have to have a voltage, right? The voltage is what pushes the current, all right? But in, in this sense here, we, we're definitely going to have a voltage to push a current. Um, but the, the big difference is, is if you're using a voltage signal, then the PLC is set up basically like a voltmeter. And a voltmeter, if you remember, has a very, very high resistance. 
And so there's very, very little current going through. And so what you're doing is you're basically just trying to measure the voltage with the voltage signal. And the voltage signals that you can have kind of varies depending on uh, what you're doing. So uh, some might have just a voltage signal in the middle range. Uh, sometimes you might have it between uh, zero to 10 volts, or sometimes you might want it to vary between minus 10 to plus 10. And, and there's some other values that, that are sometimes used, okay? But the, the key here is, is the fact that if we have a voltage signal, then we need to have the PLC or whatever device set up like a voltage meter. And so we're gonna have very little current going into the, the PLC and it's just trying to sense the voltage. And we'll, we'll get into more detail of those and in a few weeks, we'll look at what the circuitry would look like for an analog to digital um, converter, okay? So, uh, but for now, we just need to know that, you know, we can have a voltage that basically, if you remember right, a, a voltmeter hooks up in parallel. And so, it, and it'll have very, very little current, which means it has a very high resistance. A, if we have a current signal on the other hand, then we're basically going to be measuring the current. So in this case, the PLC or whatever device that's measuring this current signal is got to have a fairly low resistance because we're going to be feeding a current into it. Now, the most common current that we would run into it is a 4 to 20 milliamp signal. Okay, and what we're going to do in lab one, as you can see there on the slide, I've marked lab one. What we're going to do in lab one is we're going to build a circuit that'll generate a 4 to 20 milliamp signal. So that means the smallest current they possibly get is going to be 4 milliamps, and the maximum is 20 milliamps. Okay, and this is the most common uh, signal that we like to use in industry uh, because the four, the reason we don't do a zero to 20, zero to 20 is usually an option, but the reason we don't do the zero to 20 is because what happens if the line breaks, right? If you get a break in your wire, then you get a zero reading. Um, because you have zero current. Well, the thing is, is that we, we like to use this 4 to 20 signal because what this says is that when the sensor says there's nothing in it, let's say you were trying to measure the level of uh, water in a tank or something. And if the sensor says, if it's a 4 to 20 sensor and the sensor output is zero, it tells us that the sensor's not working right, as opposed to the fact that the tank is empty, right? The tank could be full, uh, but the sensor's not working because it's outputting a zero milliamp. And so that's why we like to use this four to 20, because if we're getting a four milliamp signal, it tells us that all the wiring is correct and that the sensor most likely is telling us there's nothing in the tank. All right. So if you if you know you should be getting a four to twenty milliamp current signal into your PLC and you're only getting zero, that's an immediate flag saying, hey, something's not working here because I should have even if the tank's empty, I should have four milliamps. And so that's kind of the preferred uh, signal for these. Now the problem with voltage signals is that they attenuate so if we go back and review our dc circuits you know like over here on the left hand side is my sensor okay my instrumentation i'm trying to measure the level in a tank and the sensor is measuring 5.6 volts and then i've got wire connecting this over to my plc but Remember that the wire, all wire has resistance. 
And so even though it's a the the PLC has got a high resistance to it, it there's still got to be at least a little bit of current flowing into the PLC so it can actually measure that voltage. And so what happens is you get a voltage drop along that wire. Okay, and so the sensor is telling us, hey, I'm at 5.6, but by the time that signal gets attenuated over the resistance in the wire over to the analog card, the analog card's only reading 4.3 volts. And so it's, uh, you know, there's it, it, the, the PLC thinks that the value from the sensor is much smaller than what the sensor is truly reading. And that's called attenuation. And again, it's due to the resistance in the wires that are connecting the sensor to the PLC. All right. And so why do we like analog signals? Well, analog, or excuse me, current signals. We like current signals because the current in a sit is the same everywhere. And so if your if your sensor says, hey, I'm at, you know, 56% full or whatever, I'm going to send out 12 milliamps. And so it's going to send out 12 milliamps to the PLC. And then of course that 12 milliamps is going to come back out and around and back to the sensor. All right. And so what happens now is that this sensor, these types of sensors are smart sensors and they're measuring that, hey, I sent out 12 milliamps, I'm getting back 12 milliamps. Now, if they sense, like if, if you add more resistance in the wire, if you add more resistance in the wire, then you're gonna have a voltage drop. And so this sensor over here, this instrumentation is going to adjust and increase the voltage that it's outputting to compensate for more resistance in the wire so that the analog card is still getting 12 milliamps of current, okay? And so, uh, so it's a current signal can detect added resistance and then the sensor can compensate for that so that it sends out the correct 12 milliamp signal or however many milliamps it should be sending out at that moment. And it doesn't matter how much resistance is in the wire. Okay, so that is you don't have attenuation because the sensor is going to uh, sense that current and make adjustments so that the current matches the level within the tank. The other advantage is, is now we can daisy chain this current signal in here and without any attenuation now you can you, so you see here like i'm i'm outputting from my sensor uh 4 to 20 milliamp signal i go into plc the plc on the right and then the current comes out and then i feed it to the plc in the middle and then it comes out of that and it goes into another plc and then it comes out again and then goes back to the sensor so I can daisy chain these current signals without any losses, okay? Now you can't daisy chain a hundred of them. You can only daisy chain about uh, three to four of these um, because each one of these um, PLCs or whatever has about a 200, 250 milliamp, or excuse me, 200 to 250 ohm resistor in them. And so what happens is every time you add a new one, right, then the sensor has to up the voltage to maintain the current or whatever current, you know, it's trying to put out. And so if you add in another 250 ohm resistor along the way, then that sensor has to up its voltage output to get the current to whatever the current should be. All right, and so, and usually those sensors are probably driven by a 24 volt supply. And so therefore, 
um, you know, it would have to, you know, it, it can't just go for on and on and on and on because every time you add a sensor, okay, so if you have a 250 ohm resistor inside this PLC and you're outputting 20 milliamps, then this particular PLC would be dropping five volts. So in this case, I got three PLCs wired up. So that would be five, five, and five. That's 15 volts. Okay, so I can maybe put in one more, which would uh, give me 20 volts. So if I had a 24 volt supply, then my sensor should be able to maintain a current of 20 milliamps out, and which would mean that it's, it's outputting 20 or so volts. All right, so, so you can only usually probably daisy chain up to a maximum about four of these, but you can definitely do that. So you can have one sensor daisy chained and feeding three different um, readings, whether they're, they could be the same uh, PLC, but a different IO card inside the same PLC. That way, if one card went bad, as long as it didn't open, um, you would have like a second reading of it and, you know, gives you some redundancy. All right. So now the, the thing is, the question is, if I go out and I buy a sensor, what type of voltage or current signal is it going to give me? And is it what I need? And the answer is a lot of times the sensors, and when we talk about transducers later in the semester, we'll see that a lot of them only put out a millivolt signal which millivolt signals attenuate very, very quickly because they're small to begin with, all right? And so what we need to do is we need to convert them either to a higher voltage, say a zero to 10 volt voltage, or even uh, more ideal, a four to 20 milliamp signal. So the way we do that is with something called a converter. So the converter, and again, you see that's bold text there. There's gonna be a test question on that. A converter is a device that's going to change the analog signal uh, from one type to another, okay? And so we have these uh, various uh, converters here. We have these red lines. These are what we have in the classroom here. And we'll be using these quite a lot this semester because a lot of our sensors only output like millivolts. So if you see here, it says input, um, here kind of toward the right it says input and then the second listing under input is zero to 50 millivolts so when we're working with load cells we're going to have to change the switches six seven eight and not eight nine and ten so that six through nine are off or zero and ten is a one all right and that will set it up for the input from a load cell because the max voltage we're going to get from the load cell is going to be 50 millivolts. It's actually more like 45 millivolts. Okay. But, uh, and then if, then you can see at the outputs up above that, we see switches three, four, and five should be zero, one, one, or off on, on for a four to 20 milliamp signal. So this converter here, will convert any of these signals. Uh, and if you notice, if you look at all these different signals, like one of them is zero to 100 volts. So you could actually use this uh, converter to read a signal that's getting as high as 100 volts and then have it converted into a four to 20 milliamp signal that we could then feed into the PLC. All right, so um, I'm just kind of highlighting those there, um, some some key things. Again, uh, anytime you see things like that highlighted in the slides, you can probably guess there would be a question on it. All right, now to power these, as I said before, these uh, these this instrumentation, the especially if it's a four to twenty milliamp uh, sensor, right? it's actually going to have to have power supplied to it, okay?
And so when you buy a power supply to power your sensors, you got to be very careful. There's two different uh, power supplies that are basically when, when you build a power supply, whoever is making the power supplies, they can do it in one of two ways. The first way is they could build what's called a linear power supply. And the other is a switching power supply. Okay. And so then there's a huge difference between the two. Okay. A linear power supply is really what you want to use for instrumentation because they're very quiet. They don't have a lot of noise. Okay. Uh, the way they're built okay is the first thing you do right i mean if when you're talking to power supply you're basically talking that you're going to have like a 120 volt signal uh ac signal coming from the wall and so uh the first thing that a linear power supply does is run it through a transformer and drop that voltage down to um you know 24 volts or 12 volts depending on you know what it's rated at okay but it's going to drop this 120 volt ac down to about a uh a 20 or you know 10 20 30 volt ac signal then it's going to run it through a rectifier and rectify that so the negative remember ac goes both positive and then it changes direction and goes back the other way for half the cycle and so rectification uses diodes to rectify the negative section and make that a positive okay then it's going to run it through some capacitors and possibly some inductors or whatever to provide what we call filtering and then you get this sort of ripple uh sawtooth sort of shape and then you're going to use like something like a, a voltage regulator, which is a semiconductor device specifically designed to uh, to level out that voltage. And so then uh, using that that regulator, the voltage regulator, you end up getting a very nice, smooth, constant DC voltage. OK, so. Linear power supplies give you a really smooth, there's very little noise in your final output of that. So you have a nice constant voltage. Okay. On the other hand, you could buy a switching power supply. Switching power supplies work a little bit differently. What they do is they do what's called pulse width modulation. And so you have your 120 volt come in and the first thing you do is you rectify it okay now remember the the here's the big difference in the linear power supply the first thing we did was step the voltage down but with the switching power supply the first thing we're going to do is rectify it okay we might do a little bit of filtering and then we're going to rectify it okay and then we're going to bring it over here and we're going to um, use a voltage to step or a transformer to step it down. OK, but the thing is, is that we already have it um, rectified. And so we end up getting a very high frequency. OK, and so the difference here is, is because we've already rectified it, we've upped the frequency, this transformer um is a much smaller transformer so it doesn't weigh as much and it costs less okay because transformers if you remember transformers are made of coils of copper and copper is pretty expensive so with the linear power supply that transformer is a big heavy transformer and it costs a lot but with a switching power supply uh your transformer is much smaller, okay? And then you, uh, you're probably gonna do some more rectification, okay? And then you're gonna filter it, and then you have a little microcontroller in here to control this whole thing. 
But the problem is, is what you end up getting out of this is very high noise. Okay. So I kind of put them together here on this slide. A linear power supply tends to be large and heavy because of that, that first stage as a, a very large, heavy transformer. So it costs a lot more money because of all that copper and, and weight in that transformer. It's not nearly as efficient, okay? But it's, uh, it's very simple to build and it has very low noise, which is the key point for our transducers, our sensors. So we have, we're not injecting noise into our sensors, all right? On the other hand, the, uh, the switching power supply, they actually weigh less, they cost less, they're actually more complex, but because they're using microcontrollers, which are integrated circuit, which are very low cost, um, even though they're more complex to build uh, to initially uh, or to, to design, because you've got to program those microcontrollers and things like that, once you got that done, right, you can make thousands of these um, very cheaply. So they're actually cheaper um but they are much noisier and so they're not good for instrumentation they might be great for a lot of different tasks but they're not really good for instrumentation because they have a lot of noise in them and they're in, that noise affects the accuracy and the output of the sensor all right so another thing that's very important here is ground so when we talk about ground Okay, um, with AC, you know, or DC circuits, we always talked about ground because you have to have a complete circuit. Okay, it is your reference point. But when you're talking about uh, instrumentation, you want to need, you want to have a separate ground from your power ground. All right, so you see here, uh, there's three different ground symbols that we're going to see uh, when we look at uh various uh drawings and stuff so we have our standard ground which is our ac or power ground uh, we also have a chassis ground so when you're talking like a plc it right it it's it has its chassis so it'll have a chassis ground and then you see this like triangular shaped one here is what we call the instrumentation ground okay and so when you uh when you're wiring up your instrumentation you want to have a separate ground for your instrumentation. You keep it away from your power ground. All right. The other thing is our our, uh, our sensors will have shielding on them. Okay. And again, it's because we get noise. Where do we get noise from? We get noise from a lot of different places. We get noise from the power supply, which I already talked about. We get noise from cell phones or radio transmissions. We get noise from lights, okay? Uh, we get noise from the electric motors. We get noise from everywhere, okay? And so we put in, uh, when we have a cable, okay, the definition of a cable is several conductors inside of one insulation sheathing, okay? So that's the definition of a cable. Again, that's like kind of a highlighted word there. Going to be a test question on it. Now, so the, the idea of the cable, you have a cable and you can buy cables that are shielded or cables that are not shielded. Obviously, a non-shielded cable costs less, all right? But the idea of the shielding is what it does is it protects it from, the, it, it helps protect it from this external noise, you know, like cell phones and radio broadcast and all this stuff outside of the cable, okay? Um, it doesn't guarantee that the noise is gone, okay? A shielded cable doesn't say that you're not going to have any noise from cell phones or that, but it, it reduces the noise, okay? So make sure you don't make that mistake. It actually reduces noise, but it doesn't totally eliminate it. We wish it would, but, you know, unfortunately, it doesn't totally eliminate that noise. All right, however... Since we have a cable with multiple conductors <clears throat> inside of this shielding, 
okay, we actually are going to get noise from one conductor into another, and that's what we call crosstalk. So crosstalk is noise injected from one of the other conductors inside of the cable. All right, and so uh, the shielding minimizes the outside interference, but we still get crosstalk. So one of the things that we try to do to minimize crosstalk is we uh, we twist the connectors inside there, uh, inside of the cable, and that helps because it injects it on one way, and then when it's twisted the other way, it injects it in the opposite direction, and it tries to cancel it out. Okay, and again, it doesn't totally cancel it out, but it helps. Okay. All right, so we have our sensor, and we have our shielding on our sensor, and we need to ground that shielding so that the any noise that uh, goes through that shielding, we can kind of ground that noise. However, you need to be careful that you only ground on one end of the sensor. Okay, if you ground on both ends of the sensor, the ground points might have different potentials between them. If they're grounded very far away, then, then it could be kind of a large potential between there, and you can actually get a current flow through your shielding, which you don't want because that can induce more noise into your reading. Okay, so to, to eliminate a current loop, you only ground on one end of the sensor. And so ideally you want to ground over near the sensor itself and not the PLC. Okay. All right, so um, that current loop noise in there is referred to as the common mode voltage. All right, so that pretty much